coming up on this week's show. We travel to Georgia to pay a visit to a town that's the birthplace of one of the 20th century's most controversial figures. Rajan meets an artist in Dubai, creating a unique fusion of traditional Arabic calligraphy and street style graffiti. I always try to bring a message of peace and tolerance and just try to bring people together. We all connected and this is what I'm trying to do, you know, with Arabic calli calligraphy is like to connect people. And I discover that Santa makes it look easy when I hop on a sleigh for an early slice of Christmas in Finnish Lapland. Let's go, son, let's go. But first, this week, we're going to Georgia. With its Black Sea coastline, forested landscape, and world-famous wine, it's not hard to see why tourism is booming in the once Soviet state. But one city there is attracting tourists for a very different reason. In many ways, Gori is an unremarkable post-Soviet town. If it wasn't for a former resident, it might not be so firmly on the tourist trail. But tourists do come, and in their tens of thousands, every year. And today, that includes me. In 1939, my great-grandfather, a Polish official, was arrested as the Soviets invaded under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. Like so many other Poles, my great-grandfather was sent to a forced labour camp and died, leaving my family to flee, eventually reaching the UK. Today in Gori, a flower bed lies in the place where a statue to the city's most famous son once towered in front of the government building. But I'd heard some locals want it put back up so I came to Gori, former hometown of Stalin, where he remains such an important but controversial figure. Он был блестящим учеником, он помогал всем, но он мучился, потому что у него не было денег. И постепенно, постепенно мальчик, который писал прекрасные стихи, который помогал все, всем, и который делал все, для... вспоминают его одноклассники, как ими был добрым. Вот он становится таким жестким. Вот, наверное, эта жизнь меняет людей. For many in the former Soviet Union, Stalin was a great leader. Over his 30-year rule, he established an industrial and military superpower, brought victory against the Nazis, and respect on the international stage. But he also oversaw the starvation, imprisonment, execution, and ethnic persecution of millions of people across the USSR. For Lia Zautashvili's guest house, Stalin is good for business. But for many here, Stalin represents far more than potential profit. He's still an icon. A hundred thousand visitors came to Gori's Stalin Museum last year. Uh, you can see here original furniture from Stalin's first office in the Kremlin. Given my family history, I have mixed feelings when I walk around the museum. For me, its interpretation of Stalin's life feels far too positive. A 
Apparently the guides in this museum do tell their tour groups about Stalin's victims, but I'm sat right now in a room dedicated to his victory in World War II, and there's no similar room in this museum talking about his political repressions or mass famines. But museum officials maintain that they're fair in their representation of how many suffered under Stalin. This is supposed to be a museum, but particularly in this death mask room, it feels a lot more like a shrine. It's actually quite reminiscent of the Lenin mausoleum on the Red Square. In 2008, a long-running dispute with neighbouring Russia over South Ossetia spilled into war. Gori suffered Russian bombardment. Following the war, the pro-Western Georgian government began removing Soviet symbols from public spaces. In 2010, the statue of Stalin was removed from outside Gori's government building. But many of the locals are proud of Stalin and nostalgic for the old days, and they want the statue put back. For some of the younger generation, however, Stalin should be consigned to history, not lauded. I'd heard that a local taxi driver knew where the Stalin statue had been dumped facing the elements in a scrapyard next to a military base. He agreed to take me. In many ways, Georgia has yet to decide for itself how to remember Stalin. Although his statue remains hidden away, the museum, which seemingly venerates him, is actively promoted as a tourist destination. But while the nature of Stalin's future in the city remains unclear, what does seem certain is that, for better or worse, he will continue to bring travelers to Gori for some time to come. So stay with us because coming up... Rajan meets the man making his artistic mark on Dubai. And I take a magical reindeer safari through Finnish Lapland.
Now, if you were watching our special show from Dubai a few weeks ago, you might remember we featured an artist called El Cid, who's based there. He's displayed his unique form of art all over the world. So Rajan's been back to ask him about his travels and where he gets his inspiration from. Calligraphy is like the art of beautifying the, the script. And um, Arabic calligraphy is, uh, is like an ancient art that has been mastered by, uh, by master calligrapher. But me as, a, as an artist, I don't call myself calligrapher because I didn't learn calligraphy from a master. I was born and raised in France and I had this kind of identity crisis, so I ran into uh, my Arabic roots uh, when I was a teenager, and this is how I started learning how to read and write Arabic. And I was looking for a teacher like to teach me Arabic calligraphy in Paris, but I couldn't find anybody, so I just started twisting the letter, extending them, and just, without even noticing, creating my own style. And that style is El Cid's unique mix of traditional Arabic calligraphy, vibrant colours and street-style graffiti that's been dubbed calligraffiti. And it's on the streets that El Cid thinks his work is at its most powerful, transferring quotes about humanity and tolerance into public spaces around the world, from the sidewalks of New York to townships in South Africa and favelas in Brazil. I always try to bring a message of peace and tolerance and just try to bring people together. We all connected and this is what I'm trying to do, you know, with Arabic calli calligraphy is like to connect people. I was lucky enough to experience this, you know, like in all the projects we've done with my team all around the world. We've been able to, uh, to see stuff and to see people reacting and create, you know, like relations and links with people. To date, this is El Cid's biggest project, an immense piece of art painted on 56 walls in an area of Cairo where a marginalised and poor Coptic Christian community make their living collecting and sorting the city's rubbish. It took over a month to complete and it gives a different perspective to an area many locals feared or simply ignored. You go to a place just to create art and then you realize that actually art is just a pretext to create human experiences and you know you, you enter a place that even people from Cairo are scared to go and we went and then actually people they welcomed us like we were family. I thought those people were living in the garbage when actually they, they live from the garbage. And that's you know we they taught us so many stuff. They taught us how to be tolerant, they taught us how to be human because they have, I don't want to say they have nothing, but they live in not the, it's not the easiest way to live. Can we just go through the, how you approach your calligraffiti yeah. for me? The only rule that I give to myself is from writing, from right to left. And then I just play, you know, like with the, with the words, I mean with the letters. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's write your name, Rajan. Rajan is like Ra, Alif. Jim and Noon. So this is Rajan. If you were pronouncing your name like Rajan, I would put this letter here. Okay? In Arabic, there is no capital letter. Mm -hmm. Me, what I do, I consider every letter as a capital, so I separate everything. So Rajan will be this one. In calligraphy, you can draw it like that. This is a Ra. I would take this letter, Alif. That's my Alif. Mm -hmm. Then I will take this is a gym, this letter, mm -hmm. you know, you still have the same shape here. Yeah, yeah. And then, that's the noon, this okay. letter. Right. So this, typography, calligraphy. You know. And somebody who reads Arabic could read that. Yeah, you see. can decipher. Arabic calligraphy is what made me um, realize that actually identity is not unique. You know, I was French and Tunisian, and uh, ironically, it's Arabic calligraphy who made me accept my French identity. So, and I wouldn't be uh, able to do what I'm do doing today if I was not French as well. Because if I learned Arabic from a young age, 
I wouldn't have like this kind of freedom of you know playing with the letter the way I did like and I'm doing today. Finnish Lapland is as close as it gets to a winter wonderland. More than half a million people come here each year in search of Father Christmas and his reindeer. Now you can't say you've truly experienced the delights of Lapland until you've been on a reindeer safari. And that's what I'm about to do. And I've been told that if I'm good, I may get to ride my own sleigh with my own reindeer. But before I can do that, I have to learn how to use one of these things. And my instructor today is going to be Eric. Is there anything specific that I should know about these reindeer? Give me some easy tips. Just be careful, yeah. And uh, do this slow moving, no, not quickly moving, because the reindeer are caring about that. All right, how do we start? OK, let's take a seat here. Which one are we going in? Who's your... I Who's think, your number one reindeer? I think uh, that's 11 years old reindeer and he knows where is the, our place. He knows where he's going, yeah? yeah. That's what I need, someone yeah. who knows what they're doing. What's his name? His name is Chapuganta. Chapuganta? Yeah. How you doing, dude? I'm Addy. <laughs> <laughs> but before my lesson, Eric takes me on a ride. Oh my days! <laughs> Like many reindeer herdsmen here in Lapland, Eric supplements his income with tourism. He takes small groups of tourists into the forest on a reindeer safari. This is a proper winter wonderland. It's so, so beautiful out here. Everywhere you look, it's just a postcard. It's getting a bit close. Oh, he shook me off. <laughs> I touched him and he shook him. He shook himself. Doesn't like me. He's staying away from me now. There are more reindeer in Lapland than people. There are around 200,000 of these animals and most of them roam free. But some of them, like these ones, are tamed and specially trained for the reindeer safaris. Apparently, these reindeer are so powerful, and this is one of the reasons why Eric isn't letting me use them on my own yet, because they would just run off, and I probably wouldn't be able to control them. Eric is guiding us at the front and controlling the sleigh. It just shows how hardy these people are. Eric tells me that if I'm lucky, I might see some wolves or brown bears roaming around, but so far, it's just me and the reindeer. We've traveled about 20 minutes into the woods and now we've come to a clearing. Eric's gonna start a fire. We're gonna drink something nice, chill out, and then he's gonna teach me how to use one of these sleighs. Now I've had a taste of the power of these reindeer, so I'm a little bit worried. <laughs> Do you get more people come in around Christmas time? Yeah, it's uh, one of the season. That's the high week, Christmas week. They want to spend the whole Christmas holiday in winter world. Today, reindeer sleigh safaris give tourists like me a taste of what life used to be like here before cars and snowmobiles. <laughs> Just a little blanket. Just a little blanket. Finally, it's my turn to have a go. If you want to go, you just say go. So I just say go? Simple yeah. as that? Yeah. OK. Go. Go. Reindeer, go! He's not listening to me. Go, reindeer! Go! He's not very obedient, this reindeer. I mean, Eric said he's given me the safe reindeer because he doesn't want um, me to have any problems. Actually, I think he's given me the slow reindeer. He's given me the lazy one. Come on! What is going on? Look, don't... You're going to be left behind. You're going to be Billy No Mates. Eric! He's not going anywhere. 
At the next roundabout, take a right. In 200 yards, make a left. I can't say I didn't try, but this reindeer is just not interested. Maybe we take the next one. Okay, we'll take the next one. Before I set off, Eric gives me some last few tips. Just pull it. And then, yeah. then he'll stop in an emergency. Well, then he will stop. So this is my handbrake, my emergency brake. Yeah, yeah baby! Woohoo! We're going! Look at this. Controlling this powerful beast. Oh my God, he's picking up speed. Go, go! <laughs> This is so spectacular. My first ever sleigh ride. I don't know how much this sleigh weighs. It's probably around half a ton, maybe a little less, but that reindeer is pulling it as well as myself so easily. It's such a powerful beast. Let's go, son, let's go. It still might not be the fastest of rides, but it seems to be the smoothest and most magical way to enjoy this landscape. This feels really Christmassy, actually. Very Christmassy. <laughs> well, that's it for this week. Join us next week when... I take a look back at some of my personal highlights from this year's travel show, including my trip to Ghana, where I met some of the country's cheekiest residents. He said he was, they're not shy. Look, Amelia. Wow. So that's next week. But if you want to see what we're getting up to on the road between now and then, why not sign up to our social media feeds? And all the details should be going on your screens right now. But for now, me, Adia Depitan, and all the travel show team here in Finnish Lapland, it's Mona Dirvan.